looking forward to a wonderful work of art. Uh, his first book is uh, Tattoo and Art History. It's currently in production. Uh, and Matt's, the title of Matt's talk this evening is Tattoos Are Not Just for Sailors. Over a Century Media of uh, Shock. Let's see how. Hold on. There is. Hopefully, there we go. Not just for sailors. There we go. Oh, someone's already downloaded it. That saves me. That saves me money. <coughs> The answer's probably not. <laughs> um, great, thank you. So, okay, I'm going to try very hard to... Um, actually, it's not, not even quarter past yet, so we'll give it a minute more people are flooding in. Um, maybe before I begin, I'll, I'll introduce myself. So... Um, uh, as has been explained, my name is Dr. Matt Lodder. I'm a lecturer in art history, uh, and I'm director of American Studies at the University of Essex. Um, I'm a historian. Actually, really interesting hearing that last talk about empathy um, and imitation, something that I'm really interested in as an art historian, and something which comes up a lot, I think, in some of the, um, some of the explanations for the phenomenon that I'm going to be talking about um, right now. So... Um, I'm currently um, in the process of curating an exhibition that's going to be um, at the uh, National Maritime Museum in Cornwall, in Falmouth, um, which opens in um, March next year. Um, and the exhibition is called um, Not Just for Sailors. Um, and I also spend a lot of time, usually in the summer, I'm a good slow news day. If ever you have like Sky News or BBC News on, on like in August, there's a chance I'll, you'll see my face because... Um, tattooing is a good slow news day <laughs> and um, one of the reasons it's a good slow news day is the reason that I wanted to talk to you today in the context of this context of normality is because basically despite kind of myself for, a, for the past 10 years of my career and actually to be fair on my um, uh, predecessors in the kind of history of tattooing um, or the writers of history of tattooing too trying to explain actually that um, tattoos are not just for sailors anymore and haven't been for a very long time. The story just isn't getting through. <laughs> so what I want to do today, this is sort of a, um, a much longer talk, uh, which is also a much bigger exhibition and a much longer book. Um, I'm going to try and rattle through it in sort of the 15, 20 minutes that I have, but kind of show you basically, starting in the present day, you can see here, this is an article from last year, uh, in the Telegraph, we're not going to reach peak tattoo until 2025. Everyone's getting tattooed now, we've all heard this. What I want to do is kind of take you back in time, take us back in time and rewind and see if we can find out where this story begins. And in the process, I think, we're going to learn something about how journalists and journalism and perhaps wider society constructs notions of otherness. And I think also just how impenetrable um, this sense of othering and otherness is and how um, impervious to historical fact um, it happens to be. So... Um, we learned, as I said, uh, late last year, we're not going to reach peak uh, tattoo until 2025. In 2011, <coughs> when I started giving this talk, um, this is a kind of... Uh, these recent examples are actually quite indicative, and I, you'll, real, you'll notice if you start looking for this now that you'll start seeing examples of this everywhere you look, and every single... I mean, this is my job, reading articles about tattooing. <laughs> This is going to drive you mad, hopefully, by the end of this talk, and um, you'll get a sense of just what, how much my teeth itch when I'm talking about this stuff. So 2011, so um, five or so years ago, tattoos conquer modern art as needles and ink replace brushes. Once the mark of sailors and bikers, body art is now sought after by the fashion hungry. So you can see the framing here. We have a kind of now, when tattooing is A, um, fashionable, and actually B, uh, on women. This comes up quite a lot. Uh, and C, kind of artistic. Um, that's the kind of now. And the past is some kind of imagined past when tattoos were for a certain class of deviant other, um, in this case, particularly sailors and bikers. Okay, so let's rewind. Um, I will skip through these, maybe you can come back to them and talk. Okay. Um, this was from 2010 uh, in the BBC. Tattoos are no longer the trophies of rockers, sailors, bikers, bohemians, and criminals. 
They've gone mainstream. Um, once associated with sailors, gang members, or circus performers, these markings are now a mainstream co cultural force. You, like, you can see these, you know, it's not just sailors, but gang members, bikers, circus performers. Um, this, is a this is a favourite one, where once they were mainly the preserver of sailors and prisoners, um, they've become a mainstream culture, a trend. Um, 2010 again, one-fifth of adults are now inked. Um, do you know why, just why has the art form of sailors, bikers, and associated deviants um, become mainstream? And this starts becoming silly and strange, even when you go back 10 years. 2003, Financial Times. Tattooing makes an indelible mark at Selfridges. Tattooing, once the exclusive domain of downmarket sailors, soldiers and bikers, is to become a permanent fixture at Selfridges. So already we have a decade of um, intransigence in the journalistic imagination. Oh, but there's more. 1990s, um, an academic called Margot de Mello, another really good tattoo historian, wrote a, an article about this called Not Just for Bikers Anymore, um, and talks about how the American press particularly kind of linked um, a, a kind of a, a past of tattooing with, a, with biker culture and with this present moment in the early 90s with um, a newly fashionable, newly artistic, um, uh, newly kind of... Um, uh, ennobled, I suppose, because you use that term, tattoo culture. And you can see here we've got the event in 1989 in Sac Sacramento to elevate the state of tattooing to a legitimate art form. Um, and you can see, for example, this um, interviewee, Liesl Gambold, who talks about her tattoos as fine art tattoos, this idea of art. This is in 1989. Okay. So, a decade at a time. If we go back into the 90s, um, again, without giving you too much historiography, maybe we can go this into, into the talk. The 90s is the time when um, art school trained tattooists began working in Britain, so perhaps that might be the moment when tattooing becomes a kind of modern artistic trend, when art tattooists who've been to art school begin working. This is by a, um, a tattoo artist called Alex Binney from um, around about 1990. Um, perhaps we need to go back to the 80s, 1982. This is good. Uh, I'm an academic, and people say, oh my god, how do you get away with being a tattooed academic? All sorts of people, said City Limits in 1982, are doing it. Lecturers, housewives, skinheads, architects, pop stars and sailors. The old and the young, all classes and sexes. If the very word tattoo makes you think of A, servicemen, B, Victorian freak shows, or C, sleazy pornography, D, the exotic east, or E, hepatitis, you are out of date. <laughs> right? This is two years after I was born. Um, and yet still, you see, we have this new, this idea of a contemporary and a past. <coughs> Let's go back into, um, so in the 80s, for example, this is another art school trained tattooist, perhaps the first art school trained tattooist in the country. On the right, a guy called Mr. Sebastian, who'd been an art teacher in the Midlands and was bringing kind of art practice to tattooing in the late 70s. Um, speaking of the late 70s, this is an article from America, but we find similar ones in the, in the UK. No tugmo tugboat annies these, nor women who work for Barnum and Bailey. One tattooed lady's an attorney, another a banker, a third a writer, and a fourth the mother of three. Shocking. <laughs> Tattooing doesn't affect your childbearing ability. Um, this says Lyle Tuttle, a really, really famous, important tattooer of the 70s, guru of the electric needle, who says three fourths of his clients these days are women. And actually, this, this kind of, oh my God, women are getting tattooed now, is a constant refrain, as we will see. 1970s, this is. 1965, in the Oregonian, talking about London. As long as there's an England, there'll be tattooing, it appears. Um, this article uh, I love, because it has this say, uh, sentence in it. But every three years, a tattooing craze seems to break out in this country. Surely if it's breaking out every three years, it's not quite a craze. <laughs> Particularly when we're talking about something that's permanent. Um, and again here, oh my god, housewives getting tattooed. And pretty Lady Norwich, the wife of Vice Count Norwich, has a tattoo on her thigh. 1965. So we still haven't found the time when it was just for sailors. Let's go back to... Um, oh, here's, this is another 60s one. Um, girls, who want, girls who are often persuaded by their boyfriends who feel a certain sexual attraction to these painted symbols. Um, <coughs> this is uh, one of my favourite tattoo history articles ever. It's from the, um, uh, it's from the, uh, the woman's correspondent in the Daily Mail from 1950, a Miss Humber. Um, the Daily Mail actually are quite constant for this, and they still publish articles exactly the same as this, 60, 60 odd years later. What will women think of next? <laughs> um, 
Like many other readers must have done, we wondered at the information given in a book review in last Sunday's press to the effect that increasing numbers of young women are having spiders on their backs. Well, suppose there'll be a decorative kind of spider. Um, right, so this horror, 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 horror. Um, our boyfriends say that the modern girl would be afraid to have this decoration done, and I doubt the whole story. Frankly, Angela, so do I. But, thankfully, some women write in to Miss Humber, and the following week they say, Thank you very much, Miss Humber, for having taken the trouble for your information about the lucky spiders. We do feel, though, there's all the difference in the world between some crude, inartistic design plastered on the arms of men we've seen, probably done, as you say, under the influence of drink, um, and a small, neat, artistic design on the shoulder where it can only be seen under a transparent dress. Um, 1950. Okay, so we still haven't found this time. Um, even here, this correspondent is obviously talking about some, you know, previous past where tattoos were for drunken men, but now they're fashionable things for young, hip ladies. Okay, so do we have to go back into the 40s? Maybe we do. Um, uh, the demand for tattooing amongst men in the services and quite a number of ATS, that's the, um, the kind of um, auxiliary women, is brisk, according to William Stokes of Ches Chester. Apparently the girls have a preference for men's names, flowers, butterflies uh, on their arms and legs. So, okay, World War um, II, lots of sailors and lots of soldiers getting tattooed in, the, in World War II, but also women. So we've got sailors, but it's not just the sailors. <coughs> Let's keep going back. Maybe we need to go into the 1930s. Daily Mail again, tattooing a la mod, fashions change in tattooing. Turns out maybe they don't. Um, sailors amongst the civilised people, the chief patrons of the art, were once disposed to display anchors, hearts, and six by keepers, darts, or spread eagles. Now it appears American youths have pictures of feminine film stars on their chests. Not just for sailors anymore, 1930. And here's one of those film stars, Gary Cooper, um, on, on the show, done by a British tattoo artist called George Burchett. Um, more from the same time. 1930s. Um, Milwaukee Sentinel from 1933. Tattooing is the rage in London society, um, although designs have changed for the, for the smart set. Um, we'll miss those out. Um, in the 1920s, um, this uh, story captivated the press. Um, the story of a Marchioness of Londonderry, Edie. Um, who had been tattooed in Japan around 1900, um, but um, her tattoos, as you can see from this photo, were on her legs. Um, it's quite the dumb thing, as I'll come to in a second, for travellers to Japan, wealthy travellers to Japan, to get tattooed while they were there. Um, but of course, Edwardian ladies weren't really prone to showing off their legs in public. Um, when skirt heights had hitched up sufficiently into the late 1920s, um, such that her legs were revealed, everyone was surprised, but by that point she'd had them done half her life. Um, and that is, I think, one of the um, take-home messages of this story, and I think one of the reasons we might start to pick out why this cliché persists. I think part of it is because most tattoos aren't visible. Um, most tattoos are hidden under clothing. Um, and so the perception of the kind of people that have tattoos are your perception of people whose bodies you see, whose skin is visible to you. And certainly up until fairly recently, when... Um, uh, office dress codes and things became a bit more loose, that would have been, for example, people digging the road. So if your bank manager had a huge back piece, or if, in this case, a marchioness had tattoos on her legs, you wouldn't necessarily have seen them. Thus, the perception reinforces itself only through visibility. The truth of the matter is much harder to unpick. And in fact, I think also it comes down to the fact that um, journalists who are writing about this um, are people who are surprised by it. Right? It's journalists who are surprised and go, oh my god, everyone's getting tattooed now. Um, it's something that's become visible to them, but not necessarily something that's symptomatic of a wider um, cultural change. Okay. Um, 1920s, London's new fad. I get really sick of this. <coughs> um, I, I, honestly, still, I get journalists phoning me every week. Uh, and I start, I've started just sending them these, and they get really cross and confused. Because they really want to write, everyone's getting tattooed now story. And I'm like, eh, you're a bit late. <laughs> um, London's new fad, this is from the early 1920s, horribly lifelike was the description of a spider, notice on the arm of a lady. Um, okay, this is one of my favourite, another one of my favourite articles ever. Vanity Fair, 1926. Um, you can see here perhaps, I don't know if I've got a zoom in on it. No, oh yes I have, there we go. Um, oh, here we are. Um, tattooing has passed from the savage to the sailor. 
From the sailor to the landsman, it sinks percolated through the entire social stratum. Tattooing has reached its credentials and now been found beneath many a tailored shirt. That's 90 years ago, my friends. 90 years ago that tattooing had percolated through the entire social stratum. The other great thing I love about this article is it includes an interview with an old salt tattooer by the name of Professor Sharkey, who's moaning that kids today don't want any artistic tattooing that he'd been doing in the past, but just wanted diving girls. And he was better than that. He's a real artist, and he's longing for the good old days, right, when tattooing wasn't so trendy. Um, and this is, you can see, Madame X, the picture which depicts the cuticle designs which will be in vogue in the coming year. Very hot for 1927, apparently. Um, woman's latest fad is to have some design set in her arms and shoulders when she wears an evening dress. Um, Daily Mail again, this is from 1914. There's quite a few around World War I. Um, women getting tattooed in commemoration of their um, children or their boyfriends or their um, husbands. Um, on the left, have you seen any this year? Tattooing in society, the curious taste for tattooing is becoming quite popular. Um, says the Daily Mail. Um, and on the right, a card cartoon from Punch magazine from 1917. Fickle young thing to the tattooist. Do you think you could possibly alter this badge on my arm? You see I've uh, exchanged into another regiment, meaning uh, she has a boyfriend from a different regiment, basically, and can't quite be seen um, with the Coldstream Guards when, when she's dating a royal engineer. <clears throat> and I think what's also interesting about these is actually, again, this kind of, not just the femininity, but also the kind of class um, uh, signifiers that are being shown in these, in these drawings. Okay, so, are we there yet, right? Are we at the point where tattoos were just for sailors? <clears throat> no. 1908. Um, they're a bit more refined in their journalistic language in 1908, but you get the message. Habit not confined to semen only. Um, that's basically an Edwardian way of saying tattoos aren't just for sailors anymore. Um, okay, uh, 1903, <coughs> the gentle art of tattooing, the fashionable craze of today. And this tells us that all the fashionable young, la young ladies are getting tattoos of the hot new thing, which is motor cars, apparently. Um, all these uh, young, this is in Tatler magazine, which as you know is um, still uh, today a magazine of the kind of upper classes, or the kind of chattering and socially climbing upper middle classes, perhaps. Um, 1905, um, this is an article from an ecumenical magazine called uh, Good News about tattooed bishops and members of the clergy. Um, many bishops and princes have set the style. Um, then we get to the turn of the century. <clears throat> Tattooing is not uncommon. Many aristocrats beside Lord Craven are marked. This is an article from the New York Times, and it talks about this fashion having been started by the Prince of Wales the future King George V of England. Um, George V had been um, tattooed in, um, uh, in Japan as part of his voyages in 1881, and this royal patronage is one of the things that kind of spurred, at least in the, public, in the press's imagination, this trend and craze for tattooing. Um, you can see articles which kind of draw upon this society fad in, throughout the kind of last decade of the 19th century. So, here we go, society takes up the tattooing fad, and there's another, another woman there. Um, fashionables follow the lead of royalty by being decorated. Um, we have articles like this. This is um, uh, Princess Valdemar of Denmark, <coughs> who'd had a bit of a, um, she'd had a fun time in a Chinese opium den and come home with an anchor tattoo. <laughs> um, uh, uh, George V, this is a kind of um, a drawing of George V uh, getting tattooed in Japan in 1881, um, taken from the souvenir pullout of his marriage to Mary of Teck that was published in the London Illustrated News. So well known and famous was it that the future King of England had a tattoo on his arm that it was, it was this kind of key moment in the story of his life in the, in the press of the time. Um, and as I said, this was a kind of fairly standard thing. If you were a traveller to Japan in the 19th century, you might come home with a tattoo. In fact, you probably would. This guy, apparently, the accompanying story tells us, is getting a sleeve full of shrimp tattooed on him. Um, tattooists actually advertised in Japan. Tattooists advertised to the um, uh, to English language in, in, in English language guidebooks. 
Um, so if you kind of got the, the guidebook to Japan of the period, you would, um, uh, you would uh, uh, be recommended which tattooists to go to. Okay. I realise I'm running short of time. But there's loads of these. Um, tattooing fads from 1897. Um, New Yorkers adopting a French fad. Um, and actually, one of the things that did happen was that I think this is perhaps one of the moments where we can sort of talk about a real change. This trade from Japan um, made it possible for tattooists in Britain to make a living being professional tattoo artists because as people with money, wealthy travellers, came back to London, they had money to spend and they wanted to get tattooed again and there was no one doing it as a kind of professional service. And so a couple of entrepreneurs, particularly this guy, Sutherland MacDonald, um, began uh, tattooing wealthy clients in London. Um, I have a whole other talk, book, exhibition about his story, but um, uh, it's an interesting moment, the 19th century in Japan. Okay. So I just want to kind of figure out that I still, still haven't quite found the beginning. Um, this one actually is from the, from the, um, nine, from the 1870s, um, talking about a um, New York tattooer called Martin Hildebrandt, who is perhaps the first professional tattoo artist in the West, and even in his... Um, even in, you know, in his uh, first articles about him um, in the 1870s, the story is, right, um, some three years ago it had a brief existence, but, the principle it, but, but now it will stay a period. It appeals to the direct sentiment um, of humanity and the principal exponent for these fashionable folks in lucrative business in the fashionable uptown thoroughfare is Mr. Martin Hildebrandt. Um, I'll finish up on this one, because this one's from the 1860s, and I, and I think if we want to find a break point, this might be it. Um, from the 1860s, in an um, anthropology book about this guy, Mr. Barker, um, who goes off to Africa, <coughs> and Mr. Barker says that he met with some savages who disfigured their hair by dyeing it with okra, so it was seen the fashionable lady of the 19th century is, after all, returning to the barbaric custom of dyeing the hair. <gasps> Um, as the wind is set in that direction, who knows but what we may hear of? Ladies dyeing their teeth or tattooing their faces? Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, just as a quick finishing thought, I think, as I said, what this comes down to is, uh, is an empathy gap. Right, I'll leave up these, these pictures. I think what this comes down to is, a, is what I call an empathy gap. Right? So it's, it's a sense that, if, and I think this still holds true today, if you're not tattooed, if you don't understand on some instinctive level why you would want to mark your body permanently, it will always seem confusing and strange to you. Um, I do talks like this all over the world. I've talked to audiences of all ages from you know, old people's homes to secondary schools. Um, I've never yet once persuaded anyone who didn't want a tattoo at the beginning to get one at the end of it. Um, and I think what it comes down to really is this sense of you either kind of get it on some instinctive level or you don't. Uh, and I think really what this, the most, well, the two things that this history reveals. One is that journalists are really fucking lazy. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and two, I think, um, I think what it reveals is that um, the people that are writing them, and perhaps, perhaps we can extend this lesson, perhaps all journalism is written out of some respect, as some sense of a lack of empathy or concern, because we have this sense of all the journalists writing these articles, that they're not looking past their own kind of initial sense of surprise or confusion or horror or disgust um, or fascination or prurience um, to actually be even interested in the wider context. All that's interesting for these journalists is this kind of moment. And the wider truth, the much more complex, and I haven't gone into any of the much more complex stories of what's really going on, um, uh, is lost in that kind of um, empathy gap. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, brilliant talk. Super, super whistle stop. As I said, cut down for much longer. So I apologise for packing it all in. But. No, beautiful, beautiful uh, slides as well. Um, are there any uh, questions from the audience? Yeah. Well, so I think so. <clears throat> you know, in a way, I'm I'm an art historian, so I sort of come at this really thinking about it as an artistic. 
practice or a, as a kind of me as a as a, a, a the phrase I often use is a medium, not a phenomenon. Um, and so I'm I'm kind of interested in in who gets tattooed or insofar as how it relates to wider visual cultures. Um, and I think in some respects we can understand tattooing in the same way as we understand other forms of artistic practice. Why painting is pop more popular or less popular than um, uh, in certain times in history. It's essentially, I think, a trend-driven, fad-driven thing. Um, and one of the th one of the so one of the things that to, it's really hard to pick the true story out from underneath all this journalistic stuff. But what um, does really seem to emerge, if you look quite closely at the historical evidence that we have, is that really the demographics haven't changed very much. The raw numbers, I'm talking about Western tattooing here, not, you know, the raw numbers are much bigger now than ever before. I think we can probably say that. There are more tattooed people in the West now than there have or have been. But the demographics, the demographic splits haven't changed too much. Um, what, what is interesting, really, and I think this is the kind of what propels... Um, Perhaps it's, 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 it's an inadequate answer to your question, but it's one answer. People don't want their, their granddad's tattoos. So people don't want their dad's tattoos. Just like people don't want their dad's trousers or their dad's shoes or their dad's haircuts. Um, so particularly in kind of recent decades, particularly in the kind of period of my lifetime, really, there is a dip in tattooing after World War II. Uh, I think that's contingent on a couple of things. One is to do with the Holocaust and the stigma of um, concentration camp tattooing. The other one is simply a general move in visual culture, um, car design, interior design, clothing, towards minimalism, getting away with decorativeness that was that um, characterised the Victorian period or the, the early years of the 20th century. So there's a drop in tattooing in the 50s and 60s. So um, people of my generation... Our parents didn't really have tattoos, and so th there's a sort of response to that. Um, and I think that's, that's part of what's going on. Um, I think we're going to see in future, if I'm kind of going to be sage about this, I think we'll see a, we'll a drop-off. I, we, I think maybe we have, I mean, ironically, I think maybe we have reached peak tattoo in some respects, um, and we'll have a kind of generation where, and I, I work on a university campus, I don't see a like, huge amounts of tattooed 19, 20 year olds. Um, and I go to tattoo conventions, I don't see a huge amount of tattooed 19 and 20 year olds. Um, so I think, I think really, actually, it's explicable in more or less in the way that we understand other forms of cultural change. It, it really is just kind of driven by the winds of, winds of fashion. Can I ask Matt? Yeah. Um, so uh, how do you, in terms of uh, your own body art, yeah. um, do, you, is, do you kind of, how do you decide when to get another tattoo what to get? Um, do you think you'll carry on getting more tattoos? Is it kind of a yeah? Yeah. So the so this is good advice in general. Really, the first tattoo is always really hard, right? It should be, because it does change your body in a really strange way. Your relationship to your body changes a little bit. So the first tattoo should be a difficult decision, and it should take you a while to decide who's going to do it and what you're going to get and where in your body it's going to be. When you get as heavily tattooed as I am. Um, I can literally walk into a tattoo shop um, or be around my friends who are tattooists and be like, there? <laughs> Fill it with a gap? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, actually, in some respects, that also becomes a kind of... I wouldn't walk into a random tattoo shop in any, in any corner, but I do, you know, I have a sort of slightly connoisseurial bent about this and kind of know, okay, I want to collect pieces of work by artists who I admire. And the process becomes much less one of kind of self-discovery and self-invention um, than one of collecting, right? And so certainly I think for a lot of people who are very heavily tattooed will tell you that their tattoos are, be, have become something of a collection. And I'm much less fussy now about where I get tattooed and what I get tattooed. In fact, um, I, have a, I have literally a few tattoos. I have one tattoo on my leg. I, have no, I don't know what, even what it means. Because yeah. um, actually that was it's part, partly because I got so sick of trying to explain to people this, this whole, again, another whole talk about tattoos and meaning. Um, but I deliberately went and got a tattoo and I just said, do something and don't tell me what it is. And it's a series of numbers that I don't have any clue what it means. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, I've not a story and the concept of meaning is much more complex than that. But, um, yeah, I think, and I think actually when you, this is why, as a kind of broader point from this, why I find this lens of art history much more interesting uh, and productive to think about what's going on here. Because if you try and pathologise this, 
And certainly, the history of tattooing is bound up in uh, academic literature with criminology, medical history, psychopathology. Um, when you pathologize tattooing, and when you think about it through a, psych um, a pathological lens, you miss all of this stuff. Mm. The this aesthetics. Is, you miss the aesthetics, and you miss the kind of, the kind of broader context. Like you miss, for example, why someone in 19th century London is getting copies of William Bourgeois paintings. Right? As not a historian, that makes complete sense to me. Mm. Right? But the criminological account of tattoos are kind of signification of some kind of deviant practice that can't account for why someone who's... Um, I mean, this is also, would have also been really expensive and taken a lot of time. Um, this is on the back of, a, I think, the son of a captain in the army, if I remember correctly. But certainly a lot of money. But as, you know, as a historian, I understand why people in the late 19th century want to tattoo pictures of like, nymphs with their bums out mm -hmm. on their backs. Because they're also hanging them on their walls, yeah. and they're printing them in their news newspapers, and they're showing them to their friends. Um, and, and, and it's that kind of uh, understanding of where tattooing fits into the broader kind of visual culture landscape of a culture that um, the, 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 the kind of all this kind of who gets tattooed or why they get tattooed misses. I'm kind of much more interested in what people are getting tattooed. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think you said a very, very good question. What was your first tattoo? <laughs> so, um, well, one of the things that, so I, my first tattoo was I got some black stars on my wrists. They're just sort of buried away there. Um, and I think I told myself some kind of quite overblown story of what they meant. Um, but actually, I just wanted to get tattooed because I thought they were cool. Um, and then actually, there's a, I, I do have a kind of whole biographical story about my, my great my great grandma was tattooed um, around the turn of the century. And my granddad woke up in a tattooist's chair in Jakarta in 1940 odd and was about to be tattooed on the end of his nose. And he woke up just in time. Um, so I was kind of warned off tattooing, and of course when you're a kid the things you get warned off of are the things you want to go and do. Um, so I think, I think I had some kind of overall, you know, as, a, as a 20 year old who was interested in tattooing, I had a big kind of set of stories I think that I told myself what all they meant, but actually I just wanted to get tattooed. Um, and actually you find that a lot, and if you watch these, um, if ever you kind of are unfortunate enough to stumble across any of these tattoo television programmes, um, there, there will often be a, a there's a great drinking game you can play um, called um, pet or parent, right? When they come in with a sob story about something that's died, and if you can kind of work out if it's the pet <laughs> or the parent first, right? Um, but often those stories, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of being a bit reductive here and a bit ridiculous, but quite often those stories will take the form of, like, I had three budgies and they died, so I want three flaming skulls on my arm, right? Because they signify my budgies. <laughs> Um, actually, that person wants tattooing, and they'll, they'll tell a story afterwards to justify it. And there is some sociological research which backs that up, actually, that um, people decide to get tattooed first and then narrativize it afterwards. So, um, yeah, I, 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 um, I spent a lot of time thinking about getting tattooed for the first time, because um, I, knew, I knew I loved tattoos from when I was very young. I thought about it very I wanted to get tattooed. The other reason I got tattooed for the first time, and this is probably more of an answer, I really wanted to get tattooed by an American. Because I'd been buying American tattoo, machine, uh, tattoo magazines, importing American tattoo magazines, and traveling to London and buying American tattoo magazines and stuff. And like, no one in England was doing the kind of thing that I was interested in. And like, in hindsight, any, any kind of hack tattooist could have done some stars on my wrists. Right? But I went to a tattoo convention in France, and there was one American guy there. And I was like, oh, you're American. Uh, tattoo me. Um, and actually, I saw him. So this was what? This was like 15, 16, uh, this was a long time ago, 17, 18 years ago. And, um, uh, I saw him like, last year, and he obviously didn't remember who I was, but um, I was like, oh, you he's like, oh, they're still in there. They're still there. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, Matt Lodder, thank you very much, Matt. Thank you. Thanks very much.